Re-bienvenue tout le monde. Donc, on est uh, au, uh, ici au premier panel de notre sommet exécutif aujourd'hui. So, welcome back from the shortest break in history. And we're now attending our first panel of today, which will be led by our colleague, Dr. Aaron Henry, who's Senior Director of Natural Resources and Sustainable Growth here at the Chamber. And he will be engaging with key leaders in the space. The theme uh, for today's panel is climate policy and innovation in resources. And uh, we're looking at the role of innovation in achieving the government's ambitious net zero target. So Aaron, over to you. Thank you so much, Mario. Um, as I said, you know, we're really excited to, to host this panel. Um, and I think one thing that, that makes it certainly unique uh, is that we certainly we have a perspective from sort of each sector of the resource sector. Uh, which I think is able to really help us speak to the different challenges and also the opportunities that are being faced within innovation. So just to sort of outline how this is going to work, um, in a moment, I'd like to briefly introduce all of the panelists. Um, and then following that, um, each will have a chance to sort of provide a, a brief introduction. And then we'll move into sort of a, a more structured uh, discussion of, of, of a particular set of questions. So right off uh, to start, uh, we have Malini Grihara, who is the Vice President and Business Development and Regulatory at Enbridge Gas. Uh, We're also joined by Mark Thompson, the Executive Vice President and Chief Corporate Development and Strategy Officer at Nutrien. Uh, Domenico Vanidarno, the Vice President of Forest and Logistics and Chief Forester at Mosaic Forest Management Corporation. And Patrick Evans, CEO at Mayfair Gold Corp. So, Again, uh, thank you to all of you for being here today for this discussion. Uh, I think you know we're going to cover off both sort of the areas from the incentives to get sort of some of these uh, decarbonization initiatives, the opportunities, uh, and as also some of the challenges that are present. So I think you know with that said, uh, Malini, if you'd like to start with some uh, opening remarks, and we can we can move from there. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at today's event. Um, and I'm really pleased to offer my thoughts on why I think innovation is so important for, for our energy sector. Um, you know, certainly COVID has taught us that the way we live, work and play can change at a moment's notice. And uh, it's led to a much, uh, us contemplating a much carb lower carbon intensity in the way we live, work and play while at the same time, the role of innovation in, on that front actually has come into sharp focus with the accelerated way in which vaccines have been developed uh, with the support of government uh, in bringing them forward. Um, when we look at our energy systems, which is where Enbridge plays is one of the largest energy infrastructure companies in North America, um, you know, innovation obviously has a very big role to play and it does so in two specific contexts. One is Canada's role as an energy exporting nation and the role that innovation can play in, in, a, in a low carbon export led growth for Canada. And secondly, of course, in our own consumption of uh, energy and uh, you know, lowering the int carbon intensity of that energy use. But first, a little bit about Enbridge. You know, Enbridge's purpose is to fuel quality of life and to do so with access to affordable, reliable, um, and safe delivery of energy. Uh, and when Enbridge contemplated on its name 25 years ago, shortly after the interprovincial pipeline uh, bought the consumers gas company of Toronto in Toronto, Ontario, we thought of Enbridge as an energy bridge, you know, from supply to demand centers. And today, increasingly, we think of ourselves as an energy bridge from today's energy systems to the future. So with that context, back to the role of innovation in our energy exports, you know, we must remember that the world's need for energy is increasing significantly. And people everywhere in the world have a right to affordable, safe, and cleaner energy. Uh, our view is that energy in 2050 will consist of conventional energy with a much cleaner carbon footprint, but also vast amounts of uh, increasing amounts of uh, renewable energy. And innovation plays a role in both of those things. Uh, and we see it ourselves with that increasing footprint in Europe and offshore wind and our attempts since 2002 to, you know, to install more renewable capacity in North America. 
uh, there's a lot that can also be achieved in terms of the environmental footprint of conventional energy. Uh, you know, in our case, we announced our ESG targets in November of 2020, and it is our intent to have a, our carbon intensity reduced by 35% by 2030, but then be net zero by 2050. Um, so, the, you know, innovation plays a role in how we optimize our energy infrastructure, how we power the energy needs to transport the energy that we do, so more renewables in how we self-power, uh, modernizing our system and thinking about how we take our energy systems into the future. Um, and then when we think about how we use our energy, Enbridge Gas, which is the division that I work in, uh, you know, delivers natural gas to 3.8 million consumers in Ontario. Well, connections in Ontario and maybe up to 12 million residents of the of the province. And when we think of the role innovation can play, we really think of it in, in three steps. The first is energy efficiency, and we're investing a lot in helping our customers consume less energy. The second is helping them use new technology that is less uh, you know, intense from a carbon perspective, uh, you know, high efficiency uh, appliances and so on. And then the third area is green fuels. And that's, you know, we, we're looking at RNG or renewable natural gas that uh, takes uh, methane from organic sources, cleans it up, puts it in our pipe, zero carbon, sometimes negative carbon because we're capturing fugitive emissions. Hydrogen is a big area where innovation can play a role. Uh, and then finally, carbon capture, um, sequestration and utilization or CCUS. So with that, I'll uh, pass it on to the next speaker. Mark, I think that's, uh, I think you're on deck. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks to the chamber for having me to participate in discussion. Hopefully you're all managing to stay healthy and well wherever you're uh, joining the discussion from today. I'll keep it uh, pretty high level to start here, Aaron, but I think just a couple of framing comments. So first of all, uh, for Nutrien, as you stated, I oversee our economics, strategy, corporate development, um, ESG and sustainability teams within the company. And from a Nutrien perspective, for those that may not be familiar with the footprint of the organization, we're the largest provider of agricultural inputs in the world. And uh, our business footprint is quite unique. So we are the largest uh, miner and manufacturer of crop nutrients globally, but we're also the largest uh, egg retailer and distributor of uh, agricultural products globally in a, in a very unique footprint in our industry. Ultimately, our business is successful when growers and farms around the world are successful and that really drives our business. And uh, we are uh, really uh, an integrated company at heart and our purpose is to grow our world from the ground up. That's core to our innovation strategy. And one of the things that makes our business quite unique is that uh, we find ourselves at what I consider to be the nexus of two uh, critical issues for society, being addressing food insecurity, but also being part of the catalyst for positive steps towards climate action. Uh, we believe that uh, our business is critical to helping growers around the world be sustainable, but also be more productive and efficient and profitable. And I think in the context of innovation, there's few industries that touch two massive societal issues like agriculture does. And when we talk about food insecurity and, and climate action, th these aren't an or in our opinion. We consider these an and, we, we think they're complementary. We think that the innovation imperative actually addresses both. And so very pleased to be a part of this discussion and how policymakers and, and corporates and all stakeholders play a role in this. So looking forward to jumping in. Aaron, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Domenico, why don't, um, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Mark. Uh, great to be here today, everybody. Broadcasting from uh, Sinemuk uh, First Nation Territory at Nanaimo on Vancouver Island, where the weather today is uh, set to be uh, bullseye, right, on seasonal average uh, for today, anyway. Uh, so Mosaic's one of dozens of major forest companies in Canada that operate on public and private land, but it's also one of almost half a million forest owners in this country. And for perspective, Canada is about a billion hectares of uh, land. 40% of that is uh, forest cover, and about half of that is what we can consider the working forest. It's available to uh, forestry and harvesting and reforestation. So this means that 
of the second largest country on earth has 200 million hectares with which to actively include climate and carbon management plans right into its forests. And private lands make up about 25 million hectares of that. And it's typically the most productive land and also typically nearest to population centers where benefits other than timber are also enjoyed by the public. Certainly uh, you can imagine them um, First Nations and Indigenous peoples uh, practicing cultural activities on these forests, uh, people trying to get some break and respite from COVID, getting some mental health breaks by walking around the forest. You've got visual quality, water quality, a whole bunch of recreation and opportunities. And of course, there's carbon. So mosaic forest management happens to hold more carbon in its forests than all of Canada emits in an entire year. And we know that because of our detailed forest inventory and carbon footprint. So these trees, like all other trees, suck greenhouse gases right out of the sky. And, uh, and that's a beautiful thing. So Mosaic is 100% Canadian owned by two public sector pension funds and their long-term investment horizon aligns perfectly with our business, which first included expansion into the carbon markets in 2011 when we sold our first tranche of offsets, forest offsets, forest carbon offsets to the British Columbia's uh, government Pacific Carbon Trust. And building on that in 2018, we also voluntarily became the first forest company in the world to have its full organizational carbon footprint independently certified. That's a big deal. And uh, you know, getting buy-in throughout the organization is needed to make these long leaps. And I look forward to hearing today about what my colleagues on this panel are, are thinking about policy on this topic and also what they're doing to establish a climate culture in their respective organizations. So uh, with that, I'll pass it over to, to Patrick. Oh, you're on mute, Patrick. Thanks, Michael. There we go. Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be part of this panel today on, on this very important, in fact, this vital topic. Um, over a career span in about 45 years, I've spent the last 25 years in the mining industry. Uh, but importantly, before that, I spent 20 years in, in, public, in public life uh, as a diplomat, uh, spent, had a stint at the United Nations. So have the benefit of uh, being part of public policy formulation as a public servant, and then also uh, a mining industry executive for uh, about a quarter century. I've uh, worked in uh, regions as remote as Eastern Indonesia, um, South America, the, the Andes in, in Peru, uh, a great deal in the Northwest Territories of Canada in the diamond industry. And today I'm representing Mayfair Gold. Uh, in fact, uh, Canada's newest uh, public gold company, we listed, started trading on the Toronto Stock Exchange just this uh, past Monday. And we are developing a, an important new gold deposit in Northern uh, Ontario. Uh, the benefit we have as a new company developing a new deposit, uh, we can of course bring all of the innovation uh, that we've learned over the last few years as the industry has, um, has joined forces to tackle the issue of climate change as we uh, look to developing this new gold mine in Ontario. So as inevitable as, as nature-induced climate change may be, we as an industry, of course, have an important uh, role to play uh, not to contribute to that climate change. And here the industry uh, you know, uh, is, is, is remarkable because it is an old industry. It's an industry that uh, has a great deal of reluctance to change. Uh, and yet since uh, public policy has provided leadership, uh, particularly in Canada, industry has been moving quickly to catch up and to get ahead of this issue of climate change, uh, which is an existential risk to all of us, not just our industry, but to industry around the world, uh, to the world's population. Uh, can we achieve zero net and uh, net zero emissions? Absolutely. Um, how can we do this? Of course, through innovation and technology, which are uh, two phrases you've heard uh, this morning already. Um, this morning, I'm, I'm on the West Coast, so this afternoon for many of you. So the mining industry, are, we are at once producers of materials vital in the battle against man-induced climate change, but also very large consumers of energy and water, often in very sensitive parts of the world, 
in the process of producing those vitally important ma uh, materials. Innovation and technology are assisting in reducing both our energy and water consumption, and in the process, improving productivity and safety, which are vital for our industry. The largest energy consumer in any mining operation, of course, is, of course, is the fleet of trucks, loaders, trains, and other equipment used to extract and transport ores. At practically all mining operations around the world, this fleet is powered by diesel fuel. And it's astonishing that that remains the case uh, despite uh, the development of technologies over more than a decade to replace diesel fuel. Eight months ago, Anglo-American, one of the largest uh, mining companies in the world, launched a program to convert more than 400, 400 diesel burning trucks to use hydrogen fuel. This is existing technology that of course has been well established by Canadian companies such as Ballot Power Systems for more than a decade. On the back of that news, uh, Anglo-American's initiative, Komatsu, uh, Japan's top heavy equipment manufacturer, announced last month that it plans to develop hydrogen power as an alternative to diesel in its heavy equipment. It expects to have a fleet of hydrogen powered mining equipment commercially available by 2030. To further reduce carbon energy consumption, a range of mining companies are already using wind and solar generation. Prior to joining Mayfair Gold, I was CEO of Dominion Diamonds, the world's third largest diamond producer and Canada's largest diamond producer in the Northwest Territories. Uh, we had an interest in the Diavec Diamond Mine, which is operated by Rio Tinto. And for more than a decade at the Diavec Diamond Mine, we've used wind turbines to supplement our energy requirements for that very remote off the grid operation. One of the most exciting and productive innovations in the mining industry in recent years is autonomous or remote operated mining equipment. The Swedish company uh, Sandvik uh, is a leader in this field with a technology called Automine. In the comfort and safety of remote control rooms, operators can simultaneously operate multiple surface and underground mining operations from drilling to blasting to hauling of ore. How does this contribute to reduce emissions? By their very nature, mining operations tend to be re in remote locations requiring workers to commute considerable distances and then be housed, fed and cared for in those remote locations, which of course means a considerable consumption of energy. Technologies such as auto mine enable miners to sit in locations such as Calgary and operate equipment on mines such as the diamond mines of the Northwest Territories. Of course, here, uh, this is all going to be aided by the rollout of 5G systems. But these are the easy and obvious programs to reduce mining's carbon footprint. There are many other areas where innovation is improving productivity and importantly, reducing water consumption. Most water at mining operations is consumed in the processing of minerals and ores. At a basic level, particular, particularly in water, in water scarce environments such as North, Northern Chile, mining companies have for some time been using desalination technology to reduce the consumption of fresh water, which of course is vital for, for agriculture in many of those regions. Beyond that, there are a number of ways innovation and technology is reducing freshwater consumption, developments in geophysics and three-dimensional mapping technologies enables mines to accurately target ore to be mined, reducing the volumes of waste recovered in the process of mining that ore. And that's even before the mining equipment is powered up. Of course, water is used principally in the processing and here X-ray diffraction technology such as copper new wave developed by Rio Tinto helps to reduce the processing of lower grade ore mixed with waste in favor of higher grade ores. This has the obvious benefit of both reducing water consumption, but importantly, also reducing energy consumption. Mining is an essential industry, 
but one that has been slow to innovate, change, and embrace new technologies. Canada's leadership in domestic and international public policy has led to a new awakening in the mining industry, one that is already contributing to the reduction of carbon emissions and will also lead to improved safety and business performance. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this panel. I look forward to the discussion we're going to have now. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, and very much for those introductory remarks. I think um, in the interest of time uh, and sort of making sure we, we get the most out of having all of you here, uh, I'd like to kind of almost collapse two questions. And so the first question is, is one that I think we simply have to ask. It would be remiss not to. Um, big news this morning in terms of the Supreme Court's decision on, on carbon pricing, that carbon pricing is a constitutional mechanism. Uh, and I think, you know, when we've approached this, as you know, Perrin mentioned, you know, there's, there's sort of advantages here and there's, of course, disadvantages. And the key advantage is that uh, achieving emission reductions requires certainty. It requires predictability. And, you know, to some degree, this really mind, you know, recognize that for some sectors and for some businesses of, of different sizes, um, it's a lot easier, I think, to, uh, to navigate a carbon price uh, than others. And so I think, you know, one thing I'd like to ask all of you and sort of an open question is one, of course, you know, what are your thoughts on the decision today? Uh, does this in some respect, you know, factor into sort of how you might approach innovation amongst your own companies? Are there some uh, business opportunities that become more available or more sort of um, something you can look closely at given sort of a predictable price structure on carbon? And of course, I think the, the other side, of course, plays into this is, you know, what can we do uh, as one of the jurisdictions, one of the first jurisdictions to put a price on carbon uh, to protect Canadian competitiveness so that that innovation can continue to take place. So there's sort of that, that two-part dynamic. And um, I, lo I look forward to your perspectives. Well, perhaps I can kick off, um, if you don't mind. Um, it's an important decision, but to me, it's astonishing that a matter like this has to go to the Supreme Court. As I said earlier on, um, you know, man-induced climate change is an existential risk to humanity. Uh, how can there be any debate about this? Um, it's, it, to me, it's astonishing that, uh, that uh, governments around the world, and including the provincial and territorial governments in Canada, are not united around uh, uh, effective public policy to tackle this existential risk. Um, where does the responsibility lie? Of course, it lies with leaders. Canada has been a leader on the international stage, but it's still very disappointing to me and to our industry that so many of the participants in the Paris Climate uh, Accord um, have only voluntary uh, targets rather than uh, absolute compulsory targets. We're not going to tackle this, 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 this existential risk if leaders such as Canada uh, are frankly intellectually honest about it and impose public policy to tackle it, and then other participants in the Paris Climate Accord don't. And that leads to the sort of breakdown that we saw during the Trump years. Uh, there needs to be a, a, a coherent, consistent, a clear public policy uh, for governments around the world. And I'm, I'm afraid that the current international accords uh, don't make adequate provision for that. Um, nonetheless, the Supreme Court has now ruled and presumably all the, 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 the provinces and territories are going to fall in line, but the government of Canada, now having imposed a tax on carbon, also has a responsibility to look at other issues such as infrastructure. I mentioned my involvement in the diamond industry of the Northwest Territories. For more than 20 years, diamond mines in the Northwest Territories have been building an annual ice road to truck diesel up to their operations. Uh, why aren't there uh, blacktop roads going to these diamond mines? The government of Canada is responsible together with the, the government of the Northwest Territories for infrastructure. If there were blacktop permanent roads to these diamond mines, there would be hydro lines taking power in. Uh, there wouldn't be the need to truck all this diesel fuel in. So government industry has a responsibility and it's embracing that responsibility, but government equally has a responsibility for public policy beyond simply imposing uh, a, a carbon tax on, on Canadian businesses. 
I just so I, much. I, mean, I definitely, uh, oh. yeah, I definitely concur with Patrick. It's uh, hopefully now something we can just move beyond with that uh, Supreme Court ruling, um, have that backstop of a federal government to uh, expect provinces to properly price out carbon and pollution. It, it allows that certainty that uh, it's the start of that certainty that industries need to start planning uh, how they do get to net zero. Um, he also uh, mentioned uh, species at risk and biodiversity. Uh, it's a similar framework to the Species at Risk Act in this country. So if ever there was a federal uh, jurisdiction, um, I think the Supreme Court uh, clarified it for us all today. And that about the advantage, about the competitive advantage, if we are indeed a, an early mover, uh, we should celebrate that. And whenever uh, acting as an early mover, um, it, it, be it investing voluntarily and getting your own carbon footprint out the door early, for instance, or coming up with policies and pricing it as a federal government before others really get around to it. Uh, before jumping to the option of, I believe, hardcore uh, border uh, adjustment measures and those sorts of tools and, and prerogative ultimately that a nation has, let's focus on and accept that we're going to have to absorb some of the lag that other countries will have and uh, and just keep demonstrating the value and the commitment and uh, how uh, the planet improves when these types of policies are in place and just accept that you'll have to bring some other countries along and you, you will, in, in effect, have to absorb and subsidize that for a while while those other countries catch up. Now, leave me a conscious that you sort of had your, your first introductory remarks uh, a little while ago. So I'm wondering if there's anything you want to add to this. Sure. Yeah. Happy to do that. So, um, you know, a couple of comments on uh, the Supreme Court decision today, um, you know, from Enbridge's perspective, as I've said, we do believe in the energy transition. We have our own targets with respect to carbon intensity by 2030 and, and net zero by 2050. Uh, and we definitely welcome the policy certainty, uh, you know, not to mix metaphors, but uh, I, I think businesses and people have whiplash from <laughs> policy reversal. So it's kind of nice, uh, you know, to have some certainty there. Uh, but, you know, I, I do want to address the second point around carbon leakage, uh, you know, leading other countries the, 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 and the laggards that, you know, might seek to take advantage of not having a carbon price, et cetera. Um, obviously, from the energy industry's uh, perspective, we are concerned about becoming less competitive. And, and I think there are certain things we do need to do to make sure we can address it. Uh, for Enbridge, uh, in particular, you know, the United States is, uh, receives a lot of our uh, energy exports. Uh, I think there are three specific actions we can uh, focus on right now. Uh, the first one is around bilateral cooperation and alignment on certain policy objectives. For example, the Biden administration um, you know, is a believer in Build Back Better. Well, we have a couple of projects, our Line 3 project in the Great Lakes Tunnel, which will build back better and be consistent uh, with that policy. Uh, our modernization of energy assets, uh, reducing the carbon footprint of our energy assets is something that can be taken bilaterally between Canada and the US and perhaps we can look at it from a North American perspective to see how can our energy exports have this lower carbon footprint and win market share in the rest of the world? Because we know there's lots of other players that have, you know, that do not have the due diligence or the carbon uh, or climate change policies or even the belief in producing cleanly. So that's one aspect I wanted to highlight. Uh, secondly, as somebody mentioned uh, carbon border adjustments, you know that has to be the quid pro quo. I mean, we are leaders in climate policy. We need to be in the tent with respect to any potential US carbon border adjustments so we can have that competitive advantage together. And finally, I think there are some things uh, you know, that work well in both countries that can supplement the carbon tax or carbon charge, sorry. Uh, you know, an innovative and a competitive tax regime uh, mm -hmm. to incentivize investments in energy transition would be really helpful. You know, a CCUS production tax credit, tax credits for renewable, you know, hydrogen. Uh, these are all great areas in which uh, policy direction can um, play a major role in that energy transition. Thanks, Mohini. Mark, do you have anything to add to this? No, look, I think the, the other panelists have, have covered the policy backdrop quite well. I think at the risk of stating the obvious, maybe what I would add is that 
for an industry like ours, and I think many of the panelists here today, our expectation is that we're going to need to go through a, a period of transition to a low carbon economy, um, which will involve long term more formative investments in transformational technologies. And again, uh, I think the, the issue of competitiveness was raised and expectations and transparency. And again, on that issue of stating the obvious, I think this is going to require significant long term capital investment to achieve some of these objectives in terms of this transition journey. And, and those decisions become quite difficult against the policy backdrop that is, you know, quicksand or moving around you. And so I think today's decision um, reinforces the status quo. But I think, you know, what's yet to be seen is how it evolves both federally and provincially moving forward and the specifics of how this regime will look. I think we'll likely have a, a chance to touch on some of this a little bit later, but I would pick up on the, the last point as well that we can look at sort of the uh, regulatory or, or the cost side of the regime, but I would also say that the competitiveness angle certainly comes into play in our opinion in terms of how we look at concepts in agriculture like carbon banks and carbon markets and what some of our peers, particularly our peer to the south, is doing to create real scale and infrastructure around uh, creating a resource, particularly for agriculture and growers, uh, to use uh, carbon credits as an incentive to create climate action. Um, so I, I think that's all I'd add, Aaron. Thanks, Mark. I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of touching on, on the carbon credit questions. So uh, we've got one, I think uh, Dominico might have some uh, interesting insights in that space. Um, one thing, though, Mark, that you mentioned, and it's, it came up in a, a number of people's comments at, at the end there, is really this question about long-term investments, right? And so I think we recognize that, that both in terms of getting to the enhanced ambitions of 2030, but ultimately you know, to a net zero target by 2050, this requires uh, you know, significant amounts of capital. It's gonna require that capital throughout the entire economy. Um, people are gonna have to be able to plan for this on, on basically projects that might have an ROI of, of several decades, really, right? And so I think this, and this question sort of goes to Malini is that is ultimately really, you know, we're seeing some pretty sea change shifts in capital markets. There's more scrutiny. Uh, ESG is, is certainly a growing force, as is, you know, uh, true climate disclosure frameworks. You know, I think there's also, there is pressure uh, in other jurisdictions of divestments. Um, and, you know, I think you, you pointed that for Enbridge, uh, this energy transition is not going to be binary. You know, there's there's certainly been a growth in renewable power with, within Enbridge. Uh, there is interest in you know, renewable natural gas and hydrogen. And of course, there's, there's needs for energy modernization. And so I guess the question becomes, you know, in your view here, does sustainable finance recognize the nature of Canada's transition? Um, and are there actions that you know, Canadian firms need to take to access sustainable finance? Um, and how do things like, for instance, the modernization of our energy system, which is crucial, Fit into those capital markets or capital markets responsive to those sort of investments right now? Great question. Um, you know, I, I think it's important uh, to make sure that the uh, the growth of the sustainable finance industry, which is you know still a relatively nascent or new thing, um, it, it does run the risk of being led in jurisdictions that are not resource economies and do not have the competitive advantages that we do. So when we start from the position that the world's gonna need all this energy and it'll consist of both renewable as well as cleaner conventional energy, I think it's really important that the sustainable finance tools and the industry recognizes the role that it can play in both cleaning up our conventional energy, but also the renewable uh, portion of it. So I think that's something we have to watch carefully and ensure that sustainable finance isn't picking winners and discriminating against energy solutions that will still be needed in the future. Um, you know, from that perspective, I think we're pleased to see that in North America, there is, uh, it, it's not this binary view. We were recently successful in a billion dollar sustainable finance arrangement linked to our ESG targets around carbon intensity and so on. So I would certainly hope that that more expansive view of sustainable finance can develop and that it can be tied in more concrete ways to the substantial ESG goals that you're seeing in our more carbon in intensive sectors in Canada. Great, thanks so much. Um, unless people have sort of an, an additional response to that, uh, that question, um, I, I wouldn't mind kind of shifting focus to another one. Um, okay, so I, you know, I think that it's been really clear uh, that 
international collaboration is going to be very important in, in our climate targets um, and meeting those ambitions. And that takes a, a lot of different forms. Uh, one thing that I think has remained um, top of mind, of course, is, is things like Article 6 and basically access for Canadian businesses and inter international offsets. Uh, I think there's a lot of focus on that, on sort of developing a global carbon market. Um, but, you know, one thing that doesn't necessarily always come up is that, you know, Canada, as, as Dominico said, you know, has a really unique natural geography. There's a lot of uh, offset opportunities here. And so I guess the question might be, you know, what are some of the natural offset opportunities in Canada? Um, and are there things that public policy needs to do to really fully unlock those opportunities for Canadian businesses and potentially international buyers of those offsets? Yeah, let me take a first swing at that. It's certainly, um, forests provide a unique biological way to deliver true, true greenhouse gas removals, as well as a bunch of other co-benefits. Cool so it simply must be carefully considered in any climate policy in this country. And as far as I know, neither the federal government nor any province assigns a book value to its existing carbon reserves in its forests. And to unlock this, we really need to start adding detail to inventory of our forests and have our accounting departments become quite comfortable with acknowledging this asset in a standard way that uh, doesn't exist now. You know, in the meantime, even though inventories are incomplete, there are farm and forest owners across the country that know their lands well and would be interested in partnering uh, with governments to get to know their lands much better from a carbon perspective. And uh, we have to ensure that landowners who invest in conducting their own inventory or footprint are incentivized to do so. And this may be direct through taxation policies or maybe indirect by simply providing that framework in exchange to allow these, these climate helpers to make the decision to take action and, and invest. These are big long-term decisions. And you know, in the spirit of the trading nation that we are, we simply uh, need to access the international markets and market prices to make sure those take and all the risks, be it uh, uh, farmers, be it uh, companies, be it individual family forest owners, or, or any resident that has a, an opportunity to develop a carbon project that they're rewarded for the highest price that what is really a, a truly universal commodity can generate. So I would throw that out there as a, as a starting point to really document and understand our asset of carbon offset potential. Are there any other thoughts there? I think I think um, both in terms of being able to establish perhaps a, an off a national offset framework for Canada is going to be very important um, as of seeing what happens with with COP26. Um, Mark, you know, I appreciate we had the opportunity to discuss a little bit about um, really where 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 you were coming from um, from Nutrien in, in terms of managing innovation. And I think, you know, we, we sort of pointed to the fact that, you know, the mining sector has both some very unique opportunities uh, when it comes to innovating, as is the energy sector, uh, as is forestry. Um, but one thing you pointed to is that in many respects, Nutrien is, is managing innovation across a number of different segments within your business, right? And so there's a, a mining component, there's an agricultural component, there's sort of a manufacturing and retail distribution and, and working with producers directly. Um, you know, have you been able to find some synergies there that you're able to capture because of all those different segments? Or is it, you know, is it, is it really changing your strategy in terms of how you're trying to innovate as, as a company? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. And I think this, uh, this uh, thread also picks up on a little bit of what Domenico was saying around the uh, carbon credit opportunity. And so I think if you go back to where I started, ultimately, when we think about our business, we've got one end customer at the end of it all that, that really drives, I think, the future and the attractiveness of our business for Nutrien, and that is uh, farmers around the world. And so uh, with this common vision, we look at how we address grower challenges, you know, how we uh, position innovation to address some of these challenging thematic issues that I've talked about in terms of remaining productive to address food security, how we play a positive role in being a catalyst for climate action. All of these things uh, ultimately make their way into where we look at opportunities for innovation. One area that I would point to uh, is a recently announced uh, carbon program that we launched uh, back in November. Uh, we believe that we've launched the most comprehensive end-to-end -end industry program to generate uh, carbon credits on farm. And it's really a nice way to think about how innovation is coming from all parts of our business to, 
really create, I think, a unique opportunity that benefits a lot of different stakeholders. So um, I, I'd probably be remiss if I didn't say that when you look at agriculture, both I think in terms of the, the practices that, that are in place already today for agriculture, but the role it's played in terms of innovation and economic growth for Canada, um, agriculture sort of has, I think, sustainability baked into its DNA. If you think about the farmer's biggest asset, it's land. And so growers have uh, an inherent incentive to be stewards of the land, and they're exactly that. We've seen productivity per acre grow continually over time. And so I think this mindset of sustainability, productivity, profitability is already inherent to what growers do. And, and I think that isn't recognized enough. But really the intent of our, our innovative efforts around the carbon program is uh, in some respect to take what could be a liability and turn it into an asset for many different stakeholders. So when we think about the program design, what we're actually doing is working with growers with our retail business to build an agronomic design plan that looks at their specific fields, their specific crops, their specific farming practices to look at opportunities to sequester more carbon in the soil, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions on a more systematic basis. And that can happen a number of ways through farming practices, but also, also through innovations at a product level, like finding forms of lower uh, carbon fertilizers, we're a leader in blue ammonia in our nitrogen facilities today through things that have been talked about like CCUS or ultimately enhanced efficiency fertilizers, along with another, uh, another uh, area of emerging products like biological products that increase fertilizer performance. So we put the agronomic program design with innovation in our fertilizer products and other practices and ultimately have really tried to innovate and invest capital around an industry leading digital platform, which is one of the, the big advantages to be able to capture field data more consistently to prove that the scientific benefit is there in terms of soils, soil carbon sequestration, and that we can prove out the benefits that we're seeing in the field over time for a grower. And importantly, on the other side of that, that data and that scientific validation allows for a carbon offset or inset to be created. And I think it goes back to Domenico's point that all of that innovation comes together to meet stakeholder demand. Uh, people like me are getting calls from my colleagues in the energy industry, in the banking industry, both domestically and international, looking for sources of high quality offsets that agriculture can generate as part of this equation. And so I really think the path forward involves uh, collaborative discussions with policymakers, with industry, with stakeholders from across different industry and with growers to figure out how we put some real momentum behind this discussion um, that innovation is really driving. Because again, if we look to the US, it's been clear the Biden administration has created a catalyst to say uh, carbon banks and carbon farming are gonna be a core part of policy in the US and that's gonna be scaled in a major way. Our growers compete globally, uh, our growers are cost sensitive and this is a huge opportunity that, you know, in our view, we really need to lean into. So I'll leave it there, Aaron. Thanks, Mark. Uh, great answers. And I think it's really showing to the overlap, I think, between um, the changing business practices that I think each, each sector is trying to pursue and, and trying to integrate more and more into their conventional business. And I think that's a really interesting story. We could probably have, you know, panels just simply on that um, rather than all these perspectives. I, I think, um, I'm, I'm cognizant of time, so we've got 15 minutes and it's, it's a hard stop. Uh, I do want to ask Patrick uh, a few questions uh, based on that introduction that, that you provided. Um, it may mean that we need to cut into some of our, our closing remarks if we're going to also maybe try to take a question from the audience too. So just being mindful of our, our dwindling time together. Um, so I think, you know, Patrick, you really mentioned um, a number of things in, in, your, in your remarks. And you know, you pointed to the growth in terms of uh, automation within the mining sector, the opportunity to displace diesel trucks, uh, as well as some of the infrastructure needs that that need to take place to sort of further that decarbonization. Um, you know, I'm curious when you look at the space, uh, what are some of the policy tools that, that I, you identify driving those changes or that are useful for those changes? And you know, are there some additional sort of steps that need to be taken so that uh, the mining sector can continue to innovate. Sure. Look, uh, Canada's Canada's mining industry is a world leader 
there's no country that comes close to competing with Canada's mining industry. Canada's mining companies operate globally. Uh, they operate from uh, grassroots exploration all the way through production and mine closure. Um, and you know, being a global industry, of course, stating the obvious, um, in, investment dollars in the mining industry are a little like water. They follow the path of least resistance. Um, you know, we, Mayfair Gold, a new company in Canada, uh, are developing a new gold mine, cognizant of what the policy framework is, you know, what we need to do in order to ensure that uh, we can operate with a low uh, carbon footprint. But there are others, and I, I've spoken to them, who I can tell you are instead looking at other jurisdictions. Yeah, we can mine gold in Ontario, but we can also mine gold in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We can mine gold in Papua New Guinea. We can even mine gold in Venezuela if we want to. Uh, it comes back to something I touched on earlier. It's all very well and good, and it is good that the Canadian government is a leader in public policy on this. And they've provided, and the Supreme Court have, have, have been helpful in this today, very clear framework. Uh, we can factor those, uh, those issues into uh, our models as we consider developing and operating mines. But we have to recognize that unless there's clear and consistent, and I stress consistent public policy globally, this is not a Canadian problem. This is a global problem. Unless there's clear and consistent public policy globally, unless all participants are held to hard targets, rather than some electing to be held to hard targets, others to soft targets, and I can assure you privately, they will laugh uh, that they're never going to meet those soft targets. Uh, there needs to be a clear, consistent, global public policy on this issue. Otherwise, uh, the mining industry, some are, are stuck in Canada, if you like. Uh, they can't uproot their operations and move them to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Others will decide, well, we'd rather develop a, a, a new diamond mine or a new gold mine in the Congo uh, or somewhere else where the cost uh, is, going to be, is going to be lower. So I can't, you know, it's great that Canada's taken a leadership. And in so many areas, Canada is the leader in public policy on, on issues like this. We've lived through a year, somebody mentioned earlier on, the obvious, of course, of COVID. You know, the, the COVID, as we see it, you know, was the third world war. The fourth world war is what we're talking about today. The existential risk of climate change that threatens everyone. Uh, you know, we're not going to tackle this unless we have clear, consistent, uniform public policy enforced globally. Thanks, Patrick. I really appreciate that. Those kind of closing thoughts there on, on that. Um, I'm going to be really honest. I'm not quite exactly sure how we might take a question from the audience. Um, maybe it'll appear in the chat. So I'm going to take a moment to see if that happens. Um, and if not, perhaps we can uh, we can transition into some of those planned closing remarks. So just uh, bear me with me for a second there. Okay, um, so I, I, I just like to very briefly um, thank, and, and for a moment, I think we can go, we can assume now that everyone will have a chance to sort of go around for a, a two minute close. Um, but before saying that, I, I also would just like to thank all of you for being here. I think this has been a really interesting uh, discussion and it's, you know, the reason that's the case is because you're all bringing such diverse perspectives, but I think still still very much rooted in, in sort of the common concern about actually being able to advance this policy, being able to innovate, but you know, the, the challenges that come from both internal domestic certainty on policy, changing financial markets, and uh, Patrick, as, as you alluded to, the fact that there's still a lot of work to be done internationally to sort of find some ways and some some pathways forward that are assure, going to ensure that we sort of align our, our actions and that, you know, we really are able to take that first mover advantage and uh, or take that first mover position and become you know, an advantageous position and attract activity here. I think that that's a, a longstanding concern and it's, it's one we're gonna be talking about for quite some time. Uh, with all that said, um, perhaps in, um, in order of which you provided your introductory remarks, um, perhaps you can each take a, 
a little bit of time, a couple minutes, and just uh, have your own recap. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Aaron. So uh, I'll get started with my uh, closing remarks. Um, you know, just very briefly, Enbridge um, completely believes in the climate change issue uh, in our own energy transition. We have the ability to lead both in terms of reducing our domestic emissions, as well as um, you know, exporting energy to the rest of the world in a lower carbon environment. Uh, we really should leverage our competitive strengths. They include the extensive energy infrastructure we've already built up. Um, you know, let's look at how uh, CCUS um, can reduce emissions in our industrial heartland in uh, Alberta. Let's look at how CCUS can allow us to produce blue hydrogen uh, to transition. Uh, and let's figure out how we take our own energy infrastructure and think about how we modernize it uh, for the future with the lower footprint and allow it to repurpose um, to uh, other you know, low carbon fuels in the future. So uh, there's a lot that we can do. We need consistent policy and uh, we need government industry and our consumers to work in concert to get us there. Thank you, Melania. Yeah, Aaron, a, a much the same sentiment that was just provided. I think uh, it's easy for a discussion on uh, climate policy uh, and one related to capital investment or innovation to quickly move to a, a list of challenges or, or uh, negatives or, or barriers. But I think th this is a conversation where certainly we as a company see uh, just as much opportunity, if not more, uh, emerging for both uh, the country um, but also for our industry in, in agriculture and crop nutrients, uh, as well as our customers, uh, growers, both in Canada and around the world, if we do this properly. And so similar to, I, I think what's been stated, um, this transition is gonna result in the formation of new markets. So whether that's new in industrial uses uh, for hydrogen and, and ammonia, whether that's blue or green uh, around the world, Canada is well positioned to uh, be a part of that. In agriculture, you know, I won't rehash what I've already described in terms of, I think the really good foundations we have here for the formation of agriculture as a source of uh, carbon credits to facilitate the transition to a low carbon economy. Um, that's a huge opportunity for a number of stakeholders and on many fronts. And so I think if, if we uh, think about the positives, there is a lot of opportunity in this discussion for, for Canada and the countries operating within Canada. And, and similar to the sentiment that was expressed, I think where we are today requires a lot of policy coordination, discussions with policymakers and industry, with stakeholders, both domestically and internationally, because we will have a finite window to get this right. And other countries around the world are seeing this as an opportunity as well. And so competitiveness will remain core to this discussion in terms of doing this right and being a leader, or I, I think getting in our own way and, and continuing to bump along the bottom and, there's a real opportunity and too much opportunity to do that. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Definitely a lot of opportunity here. I encourage everybody uh, to focus on uh, taking what we've got from the Supreme Court today and begin to be more precise in how we value and, and assign uh, that to climate health in our businesses and our lives as Canadians. So clearly emitting less carbon dioxide is the best thing we can do. Uh, but absorbing more of it uh, in and through living ecosystems is also uh, second best, I would suggest. And it was great to hear the minister today talking about building with more wood as part of the circular economy, much like farming is certainly, and uh, all, the, uh, all the other mining and mineral products that we need to make that happen. But there's a commitment to pursue more transparency and consciousness among Canadians about their carbon footprint. So finding ways to help Canadians make uh, smart choices is key, I believe. Uh, imagine a day not far from now when you buy something that isn't food and you see something like what you currently see on the side of a cereal box. Uh, you got the calories and the fat, protein, percent daily values. Uh, you know when you throw cocoa puffs in your shopping cart, it's different than shredded wheat. Uh, you got that kind of language into uh, everything else we buy and you understand your effect on the climate and ultimately your own health too. So that's how people's behaviors will, will change and uh, that can only happen if we commit as a society to do the research and translate this, this vast global and as Patrick uh, reminded us existential issue into the daily choices that uh, anyone uh, can make. So as industry, uh, I believe um, we're all here and ready to do our part. So thanks for uh, having me here today, Patrick. Cool.
Thank you very much, Mark. Um, as the final uh, panelist to speak, Aaron, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you as the moderator. Uh, you've, I think, brought the, the, the best out of our respective perspectives on this vitally important uh, issue. I also thank the Chamber of Commerce uh, you know, for, for recognizing the contribution that industry can make to this debate. Uh, we, we, are, we are not uh, the, the, uh, the only participant uh, or the only one who can contribute to a solution. Um, you know, we are part of the solution, which uh, all of us have, have, have uh, articulated today. Um, my industry, the mining industry, as I said earlier, is a very conservative, very slow to change industry. We applaud the Canadian government for their leadership on this issue. If it wasn't for the leadership of the Canadian government, uh, I can assure you that some of the innovations that I described today would simply not have occurred. Uh, this is vitally important. Leadership in public policy is vitally important. I'm really optimistic about what we as the mining industry and industry collectively represented here today can do to contribute to combating climate change and achieving net zero emissions by 2050. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, again, I, uh, I want to thank all of you for, for your time today and for being part of this panel. Um, as I said, you know, I think we've, we've had a really interesting discussion and it, it comes down to all of you and, um, and the perspectives you were able to bring. And uh, I, I know that this certainly is not the last word in terms of this conversation. And uh, we'll probably be having many conversations like this uh, in the months and, uh, and years ahead. So looking forward to that.